So, you know, the topic for today is data science in retail. In fact, we're kind of switching to use cases, um, you know, because we will have a less lectures than we planned originally due to all those changes in schedule. I will ha we'll have to sort of combine some of the materials. So we're going to have a pretty dense um, lecture today in terms of the material. Uh, we're going to cover a bit of uh, business side and talk about actually retail. And then we're going to talk about data science and modeling and how to do um, forecasts within retail and how to use machine learning and regression um, for that. Okay. So let's get started. First of all, what's retail? I mean, you know, retail is a subject that is we're all familiar with. Um, but if you, if you want to be formal, well, it's a sale of consumer goods or services through various distribution channels directed to the consumer, right? And, uh, you know, thinking about retail, there are, you know, various segments in the retail. Um, there is, you know, grocery and, and food retailers, and that's what we're mostly familiar with, right? There is fashion apparel, um, there are department stores, um, there are specialty retails, um, like, you know, this, uh, you know the, the, the instruments. And then there are like restaurants, cafes, sort of fast food, fast moving goods um, type of retail. So this all goes under the umbrella of retail. And as a consumers, we're used to the sort of front um, end of the retail, right? So we go to the store, we pick up the, the stuff, we buy it, we go home. Now, but in order to understand what's happening, you know, inside, inside the system, let's take a quick look at, um, you know, real retail supply chain, right? So this is how those goods that we're using getting in there. Um, so first of all, uh, you know, we, it's, it's all starts with raw materials uh, and then the manufacturing happens. Um, then after that, um, the, the product goes to either, you know, distributor, or sometimes it's wholesale supplier. And after that, it gets to a retailer. And finally, to the customer, the consumer. So retailer is really that place where, you know, supply meets demand or demand meets supply. And it's a uh, retailer job to make sure they match, right? Now, if they match perfectly, life is wonderful and retailer makes profit. If they don't match, what happens, you know, retailer, if, for example, there is an oversupply, retailer loses money uh, because you know, invested in, in, in manufacturing, in um, delivery, um, and so it cannot sell the stuff. Um, or other way around, if there is a demand but no supply, well, you use an opportunity. You could have made money, but you didn't. And there are a lot of examples when that happened. So... In this sense, you know, the, the, in the best interest of retailer is to predict the demand, right? And then uh, based on that, you can sort of work backwards through the entire supply chain and make sure everything works just right, such that in the right time, in the right place, in the right store, at the right time, there will be the right product for the right customer, okay? So, and that's pretty much the job for retailer to work this out. Now, you know, if you think about sort of different level of, of modeling and different decisions that should be made uh, by a retailer, there's really sort of two sides of the, of the story. Uh, one is uh, um, operation side of the story or what store and, uh, you know, what, what store should be do, should do, what modeling should be done um, sort of on, on the side of the supply. There is also modeling that can, can be done regarding consumer to understand the consumer preferences. So if we're thinking about um, the, uh, the operations, the store operations, well, there are things that uh, can be done. For example, you can think about um, the, well, the problem that can be solved with data is you know, demand forecast, right? You can try to predict demand. You can try to predict sales. By the way, What's the difference here? Do you guys feel the difference between sales and demand? We do, yes. So are they, are, is it the same or are these different things? I don't. <laughs> you don't what? 
I, I, I don't I, understand the difference between demand and sales. Right. Uh, I, I suppose that demand is uh, what people w want to buy, but sales what they buy in, what they buy uh, in fact. So if uh, supplier don't have enough uh, uh, enough goods of of some kind, but people uh, have a strong demand, uh, so uh, some of uh, some of people uh, will stay uh, 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 will stay uh, um, without any particular goods. You're absolutely right. So the difference is that sales is really um, the, the 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 demand that actually being satisfied, right? Um, and uh, what you have as a record in the store, you do have your sales, right? What the, the item you have sold. But, uh, you know, you, you can easily imagine that you were out, that the store was out of stock and then uh, there was a demand, but, uh, you know, there was no uh, items. And so the demand was actually higher than the sales. That's one thing. The other thing is, um, there is always competitive products and, uh, you know, demand for, for, for example, for beer, well, there were multiple brands and types of beer. So you have to be very careful to understand. It's very easy to see the sales of each type of the beer, but in general demand for beer, it's not that easy to calculate because some of the things can go on, 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 you know, on sale. Then there is delay, for example, demand. There are goods that you can buy um, that, you know, lasts for a long time, and then there are goods that you buy daily. Um, it's also not very easy to, you know, put all these things together. So anyway, demand is harder, harder to compute uh, than sales. Oh, and by the way, demand is also can be, you know, your competitors also sell things uh, versus the store itself, right? So then again, you know, understanding demand is not that easy. Now, sales at the same time is actually easier and in fact sales forecast is sort of a driving force for all other forecasts you can actually take the sales forecast and you can try to approximate demand based on the sales forecast but sales is what you actually compute from the data you have at store right then based on the sales forecast you can calculate also the, the you know required buying volumes for, for all type of goods and then you can actually optimize and do your inventory management so knowing when and what type of um, you know, goods and SKUs you need to have in your inventory. Then there is always a question, okay, um, if you are like one little mom and pop store, that's one thing. But if you're a you know, big network of stores, then um, you actually want to understand what type of um, goods you need to deliver to each stores, right? Because different stores will have very different sales on different items and that very much depends on the geography of the store and many other factors so um, it's a store allocation problem right you want to understand what to put what SKUs and SKUs is stock keeping unit right so um, any item is identified as SKUs but SKUs what SKUs you need to put in which store and in what quantities then there's a question about price right because uh, you know what price to put um, you know, the, the, the cost of manufacturing and the price you sell with, well, you know, they don't necessarily match. In fact, you know, the price is determined by the demand, right? And uh, what one can do is you want to come, come, can calculate optimal price because if you, for example, manage to sell the same item at different prices, then, for example, putting it on discount at some moment of time, then you can actually calculate price elasticity, which is the willingness of people to buy the item at the different prices. And based on that, you can actually calculate the optimal price such that you, know, you maximize total revenue, which is uh, the, the price of the item times the volume that being sold. Um, then you can think about promotions or markdowns in the store. For example, figuring out how to do promotion, uh, you know, how to optimally do this when and what to put on the promotion, and most importantly, eventually, when promotion happens, how to understand was it effective or not. And you know, there are many more things you can actually do on this sort of buying logistic sales side or you know, operations, store operations side. On the other side, there is this customer. And customer is, of course, it's marketing that works mostly with customer, 
Um, you know, first of all, there is this personalized marketing, which means, you know, what kind of offer give to a person and when, right? So you want to make sure um, every person will get the offer that will be more proper to that person, which means, you know, will increase the likelihood of the purchase and at the same time will not waste, uh, you know, company or stores money, right? Because if somebody gonna buy this anyway, why would you want to provide um, a discount? Or why would you want to provide a discount to everybody? If, for example, people have very different sensitivities to prices, somebody gonna buy an item, doesn't matter what it costs. I mean, within certain uh, limits, um, within certain ranges, um, other person would need a discount to buy it. So you do want to personalize offers. Then there is a question of, okay, uh, what would we recommend you? you? You come to the store, and of course, this is, at this moment, for example, recommendation works best online uh, because it's the easiest way to interact with a person, but it's definitely coming to the store, and I'm sure you have seen this already if you're you know, using um, you know, some of those loyalty programs. Um, I'm sure you, you, will, you have seen uh, you know, in your mailbox, so those personalized um, the recommendations. Um, and we'll actually spend one of the lectures on building those type of recommendation engines. Um, then it is uh, basket analysis, um, market basket analysis, the idea of uh, what people buy together. And that's used also for recommendations and also for shelving, for putting um, stuff on the shelves. Cross sell and upsell is, you know, you buy beer. Well, what would suggest you to buy, you know, um, with beer? Um, upselling, you buy this, uh, you know, you buy coffee and we'll offer you an espresso, which is more expensive, but we'll offer you with a discount. So for the first time you buy it for free and we'll hope you're going to like it, um, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, propensity to buy, uh, you know, you, you, what, what's propensity for, for a particular person to buy a particular item. And based on that, optimizing loyalty programs. Finally, there is, you know, there is an opportunity to do right now like sentiment analysis. Um, because a lot of people, you know, writing feedbacks using you know, Facebook, um, and Instagram, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So there, you know, looking at this, there is multiple um, places where data science and analytics can be used. Um, in any, but in any of them, you know, the overall idea is that you know we do some sort of predictions, right? We analyze the data then we either do numerical optimization or maybe it's you know, business optimization with ultimate goal either to reduce costs or to increase revenue, right? And so whatever you do, I mean, the, the analysis all leads to that. In this course, we're gonna be focusing on uh, you know, prediction, on forecasting, but remember that, for example, if we try, if we do better sales forecast, based on that sales forecast, you can, you know, optimize buying volumes, you can optimize inventory, um, you can actually think about markdowns. Uh, if you have a large inventory, you can even think about the workforce optimization depending on your sales forecast, all right? So that's like the, the, the big, big picture. Now, today we're gonna look, uh, we're gonna work, actually in the homework, you're gonna work on the sales forecast and we're gonna talk a little bit about sales um, before we go there, I just want to give you one more example. Oh, uh, and before I go to the examples, um, you know, when you deal with the data, you know, I mean, the, the, the stores have collected data for a long time. And of course, um, you know, demand forecast and sales forecast has been around, you know, for hundreds of years, right? But the, the difference, what used to be and what we have today is the level of granularity. Uh, with the data available and with algorithms available, we can actually have forecasts on the customer level, which means personalized for every customer. We can, you know, do certain type of, uh, you know, run certain type of algorithm and have certain type of predictions, certain offers. And in terms of the stores, we can actually do, uh, you know, predictions and and you know sales predictions and everything else based on actually store level, do it on the store level, do it even on SKU level, which is on each type of the items being stored. And so typically you're getting like two types of data. One is a sales data from the stores where, you know, it talks about which, which has usually, you know, time of the sale, you know, the store, the SKU, and for SKU, there's usually category, model, color, size, depending on what you're buying, units bought, money made out of it, right? And for the customer data, it's usually CRM, customer relation management um, software that hold it. 
It's usually information about, you know, customer, um, you know, the date of when the customer was purchased, uh, I'm sorry, shopping, the location, you know, SKUs bought, you know, how many, you know, how much money is spent, right? And depending, and that information usually uh, stored in loyalty programs. I mean, you know, the only reason you have those loyalty discounts and loyalty cards is because the stores want to collect this type of information about you, so then they can target offers for you, right? So there's like no free lunch. Um, there are also data that might be available, sort of additional data, which is, for example, data on promotions when certain items goes on promotion in the store, right? Different marketing campaigns um, that happens, um, you know, that there might be external data sources like, um, you know, states of economics, um, you know, unemployment rate, geographical information about the stores, you know, population. Uh, information about brands and how they how the popularity of the brands evolve, etc., etc., etc. So you might actually have a lot of external information that can enrich your you know sales and customer data for you to make certain type of predictions. So this I just want to give you a quick sort of you know idea of how complicated in fact sort of some of those things become very, very, very quickly. Let's say I want to, we want to measure the effectiveness of any promotional campaign, right? So promo effectiveness. Um, and so we have a, for example, you know, we have a typical sales that, uh, you know, you would expect to have happened in that store on that particular item uh, without any promotions, right? And then, you know, you have additional sales that happened due to the promotion. So finally, you measured that how much sales has happened. So it is uplift in sales that you have here. All right, but what we want to understand is effectiveness of the promotion, right? So we want to understand how much extra money, how much extra revenue promotion brought to the store. Well, um, first of all, if it's promotion, there are some discounts and you, know, you get some discount investment, right? So that's how much you got sort of gross sale uplift after the discount. But when you do discount, you cannibalize sales of other items that similar. Again, if you, you know, beer, there's might be another brand of beer sitting next to the bottle. So um, if you have a discount on one type, one brand, you know, the, the, the sales of other brands decreases. Then what happens, what might happen is someone is in fact, um, wanted to buy um, wanted to buy you know that that beer or wanted to buy something else not that beer but the beer is on the discount so somebody will buy it instead of some other items they wanted to buy right so you know you, you can embolize other sales and other promotions um, then um, there you might you know run into this uh, effect of their um, delay in the demand, right? When you, for example, somebody buys it right now, it's on the discount, and then they're not gonna buy anything for the next half a year because they bought, you know, 200 bottles of beer, right? So there are a lot of effects that um, that's happening. And if you have large stores, that's, uh, you know, that, that can add up to a significant amount of money. And so the net promo effect is not that easy to calculate. You actually need to go through all those things uh, and put all of them together, right? Now, this was just an example um, that in spite of the fact that, you know, the data is sort of simple, right? You just have the tables um, and, uh, you know, everything is in there. There is still um, a lot of things you need to do if you want to get a sort of clear answer on, on some of the questions. Now, what we're going to do today, we're going to talk about, you know, sales forecast. And, you know, forecasting is really just estimating future sales. You know, if you're a manager, what you expect to see is on the left, right? You want to see, you know, the revenue that you're going to get in the next, you know, you want to see the sales and the revenue you're going to collect uh, based on those sales in, in the nearest future. And then you kind of making a decision, executive decision based on that. You know, if you're a data scientist or analyst, what you're actually looking at is you have past sales, some transactions that has been reported, and you have you want to predict future sales, right? Um, now, 
you know, sales can be measured in, in, in volumes, sales can be measured in dollars, uh, you know, whatever, whatever you decide to work on. You can think about sales also on a different level of granularity. You can think about sales on SKU levels, so which means on particular item levels. You can think about sales on you know, item types. You can think about categories. You can think about sales on the level of the department, on the store level, et cetera, on the, on the, on the country level if you're multinational with, you know, say, presence in, in 150 countries. So there are different levels of aggregation you can do and there are different level of forecast um, you can do. So forecasting methods. Now we actually, you know, this is, you know, honestly, this is a very, very big and rich topic. And I thought we'll have, we would have a chance to dedicate entire lecture to it, but, uh, you know, not this time, not this year. So, um, and that's why, you know, it's pretty much going to be shrinked to like two, three slides, uh, but make it sort of enough practical so you can use this. So there are really two main methods, two main approaches to, uh, you know, to forecasting. And uh, let me grab, okay, my annotation one. Okay, so the, the, the first method, which is very much a traditional method that has been, you know, used by, um, you know, economists, you know, econometrics, and, you know, for pretty much for 100 years um, in sort of various type of methods that deal with, um, I would call it sort of brute force time series forecasting or signal extrapolation. So the idea is that you do have a signal history, right, um, where you have something that changes with time. And that something can be gain sales, can be temperature, can be, I don't know, anything you want, any quantity you want. You don't have a lot of external factors. And there is probably some structure in the signal, which is, by structure, I mean, there is some sort of periodicity in the signal, for example, um, seasonality, right? Something increases your summer month and then decreases in winter month, like temperature. Or um, there is a trend, for example, things kind of growing slowly with time. But most importantly, uh, what you want to do with this type of modeling is to express the future value as some sort of function, some combination of the values at the previous time points. Okay? So, um, you know, the simplest example, my prediction for tomorrow's stock price will be today's stock price. That's gonna be Y at T plus one is equal Y of T. Or I can say, you know what, um, the temperature tomorrow is going to be an average temperature for the last week. Then, I, then it's uh, Yt plus one is, you know, one divided by seven temperature in the last seven days, right? And there are many more methods. What I, by the way, what I just described is called moving average, uh, but there are sort of more advanced methods like exponential smoothing, ARIMA, you probably heard that um, in economics, um, and many more methods. But again, the key to those methods is they operate on the same time series, right? So this is sort of the way you, you work on this. You take, you look back at the historical data and just based on the values of the function Y, you predict the future value of that. So you predict future sales based on the past sales and that's it, you're not using any other features or any other factors. Another approach, um, that became well popular now, right? With with the advance of machine learning, is you know point matching and regression or machine learning approach. And um, the difference here is, you know, in terms of the data, what you want to have is you want to have not just one signal, but you want to have probably lots of similar signals. So if you think about, um, you know, sales, you don't want to have just sales from one store would be good if you have sales from multiple stores. And you know that there is probably common behavior across that, those stores, right? Um, you know, you're thinking about, I don't know, COVID, it's not only the way it evolves in one country, but it all, also involves in multiple countries. So you can actually kind of learn from behavior of different countries. 
there are various factors that you know affect those types of behaviors and that can be you know the location of the store um you know it actually can be you know temperatures it can be discount it can be a lot of things but there are many of them they're typically large data sets um and what we're trying to do is we're actually trying to model the value of the function as a combination of values of the factors um, at some moment of time. Now, if I do it the way I, I showed here, um, this is you know, possible to convert into forecast, into prediction under certain conditions. We're gonna talk about that. This one looks more like forecast because you're saying oh, I'm gonna predict the value of value of function y at time t plus h as a function of the values at you know, previous moment of time. And x and x1, x2, et cetera, these are those factors. Well, in fact, um, we can actually even admix y in here. We can add here also sort of y as a variable. Um, then we, we will kind of mimic the behavior of um, the time series forecasting approach. That is also possible. And so what we're gonna do, we're gonna focus uh, in this course on, on, on this approach, all right? Though um, there are definitely situations where the traditional pure time series signal forecasting um, works and it works pretty well. Um, you know, we still want to, to kind of explore um, these options. And again, time series forecasting, it's, it's, you know, it's, it's signal processing and uh, this is how like econometrics economists used to work a lot. Now we want to deal with lots of external factors. We want to train on multi multitude of data and we want to be able to do forecast to run forecast for like, you know, SKU levels. Um, very often, if you try to just do time series forecasting, you won't have enough information of that granularity to make those predictions on every um, item level. Okay, so that's where we stand. Um, just again, to, 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 to dedicate one slide to time series forecasting, um, you know, what you do usually in this type of forecast, you can, either, you can for example, detect seasonality and you can detect trend. And this is um, the picture on the left um, where you use periodicity, you detect the periodicity of the signal and you try to extrapolate to the right um, using that periodicity. Or what's done most of the times um, is you using this sort of moving box sliding window approach where within that window you calculate certain features um, of, of the signal and then you extrapolate it to the right. And depending on, you know, on some method, you can actually get different predictions, right? You can actually take, um, you, you know, you can extrapolate as a, as a linear extrapolation, you can extrapolate on a high level functions, or you can actually just, you know, extrapolate for one step forward, and then you take um, and, and move this box, move this box sort of to the next location and do the next prediction, and then, you know, slide it more again and do the next prediction and slide it more and do the next prediction. So there are those type of approaches. Um, any questions so far? All right, if no questions, I'm, I continue. So, you know, forecasting with regression, right? That's sort of forecasting using machine learning. That's what we are interested in. And, uh, you know, here you have, an, you see an example where we, you know, we, we train the data on this historical uh, values from you know, 95, 2010, and then predicted this interval going forward. So how can you do this with, with a regression? Um, I'll give you a few examples, and then Anvar at the, 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 the seminar will go in depth on you know, how this can be done, right? We'll demonstrate um, it um, on the real data. So the idea, is the following. You know, if we do sort of traditional regression, and uh, what I want to show here is uh, 
um, you know, timeline. And let's say this is today where you have a vertical line. And this is the values of y, and this is the value of parameters, of some parameters from which y depends. Right? And then you know, I can try to write a regression function that y at fun at, uh, as a function of time is a combination, some sort of combination of the parameters at the same moment of time, and maybe some other factors that do not depend on time. Now, what could those factors be? Well, uh, if we're trying to model stores, um, that can be location of the store, right? It doesn't change with time. Or it, uh, you, know, you can actually even think about using this for um, you know, time when there is a discount or no discount. You can just use this as a signal variable. Um, but in any case, you know, if, you try, if we want to model it that way, we still need <clears throat> those factors that are time dependent. And so that means we can calculate our value of our regression you know, at the same moment of time as, there, as when we have those factors, but you know, we cannot go into the future. The only way we can go into the future here, if we get rid completely of these factors, right, of time dependent factors, and just use those factors that do not change with time. Now, will that ask, will, will, would that allow us to make a good prediction? Well, you know, sometimes it actually works. It works not bad because um, if you encode into this X, you know, four, five, six, if you encode, for example, you know, days of the week, it doesn't really matter, um, you know, what the date is, but it's Monday or holiday. Um, that actually, uh, you know, tells you a lot because if you notice quite often those seria, those uh, the data is very very much periodic and so um, you can literally just sort of learn um, and, and it, on, on what happened in the past so that's one way to do it um, another way to do it is um, on this next slide is the following we actually want to predict the future, right, from the past. So how do we do this? Well, we can actually try to learn the value of the function at t plus h right here, the value of the function right there, based on the value of the parameters, the value of the features at the time uh, that is t minus h, right? This is t plus h, the time is t minus h. So we kind of try to look forward in this window. Now, in order to do that, when you actually build and train your model, you need to take this into account. And uh, you know, if I want to predict these values, I will need, okay, let me grab this one too. I want to predict these values, I will need to train on these values. If I want to predict these values, I'll need to train on these values, right? So um, you need to carefully arrange your um, you know, training data set with certain shifts or with certain time lags. And then you can predict into the future, right? Does this make sense? All right, I, I actually don't know, guys. Say something. Yes, it is. Yes, yes. Okay, good. Now, this is an important point because you will have to do this, right? So if there is something not clear, uh, right now it's a good time to stop me and ask a question. Why you just predict uh, y t? I mean, maybe it's uh, really better predict delta because uh, delta between uh, y type plus one and uh, y t, it's has a narrow, I mean, window, uh, corridor transition than uh, base. That's a good, yeah, that's a good point. Um, you know, and quite often you actually do differencing, right? And then for example, you know, you can remove non-stationarity in the series by doing that and predict delta t's. That is true. 
but you know if we predict far out those deltas can be actually pretty large so you know sometimes that works better sometimes not uh, this is something to try guys so what 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 he was suggesting is instead of just predicting y of t plus h try to predict y of t plus h minus y of t for example right and try to predict that delta um, you know again sometimes it works better sometimes not but that's a good valid suggestion okay so moving ahead um well in some sense this is moving ahead or you know stepping back because i realized that last time we kind of went very very quickly through uh, you know modeling and there were for people who are not familiar, who hasn't done this before, um, this might be somewhat confusing um, in terms of you know, how you actually evaluate model qualities. And so we're gonna talk right now about a bunch of regression models, but I also want to emphasize uh, you know, how you measure model quality. Because um, you know, ultimately it's all about you know, quality of your model, right? It's about quality of predictions. And so you need to be absolutely sure how to measure it, you know, what to measure and how to measure it. So we talked previously that uh, if you want, for example, you know, measure the quality of regression, and we're talking today about regression, what do you, there, are, there are a bunch of metrics available. But the idea is that, uh, let's say this is your model, right? That's your, your prediction um, for the values. And, let's say, and this is using linear regression. You know, the way to read it is if here is um, an input, an X that we're given, our model will predict this value, right? This value of Y of output. So if this is a value of X that's given, the model predicts this value as an output, right? This value, so this point, this value, while the real one is this one, so that's the y value. So here we have the difference. And that's the difference. That's the error, the mistake that the model made for this particular point. That's a mistake, right? Here is how far off is our model here. How is far off is our model? Here's how far off is our model. And based on those distances, you can calculate various metrics. Now, some of them, like for example, mean absolute error is the difference in between absolute values. Um, another metric, you know, mean squared error or um, root mean squared error, you, you usually hear about RMSC, here it is. Um, this is square root of, of this, uh, of uh, mean squared error. Now, why do we have two different metrics? Well, in fact, for example, mean squared, um, you know, mean squared error is much more sensitive to outliers, right? And if you have, um, you know, it, it's, if you have points that are far out um, because of the square there, um, they, will put, they will have a pretty strong impact on your metrics. And quite often uh, we measure what's called R squared, which is the difference in between, um, you know, the, the variance, the difference in between the sort of this, this length divided by the difference in between the prediction and the average value. And that R squared, um, you know, it's, it's when it is uh, one, life is good. Um, when it is far away from one, well, it's not so good, right? So that's sort of the, the metric. Now, we talked about this before, um, but there is one thing that remained, I think, unclear, and I really want to nail this today. So there would be no questions about it, and we all understand, um, you know, how it works. And this is this training and testing concept. Now, remember um, when we talked about training and testing, where we, you know, I said that look, um, what we're going to do is we're going to split the data into two parts, uh, into two pieces, one for training and one for testing. And we said, okay, it's maybe you know 20, 80 or, or, or you know, 70, 30. Uh, and we're gonna use train to build the model and we're gonna use test to test the model. And this is probably like the key concept in machine learning, right? The fact that you want to train the model on one data, on one subset of the data, 
and verify it on, on the one that the model has not seen. Now, why is that so important? Well, because what we're trying to do is we're trying to predict um, the values that the model never seen. Because predicting what model already seen, what is available to us, you know, doesn't make any sense. We already have that, that information. So in some sense, the, the quality of the model on the training set is useless to us. We really want to see what kind of error model makes on a test set. And error on a training set is just helping us to tune up the model better. Because if it behaves badly on the training, it will not work well on test at all. So in some sense, what we're doing is the following. Here is the data you know, that exists in the world. We took a sample. We train a model to perform well on this sample. It can predict really well on this sample. But the question for us, when we put this model into the wild, right, where when we start using it on the data that model never seen, will the model perform well or not? And the fact is the performance of the model on the training data does not tell us that. And that's why what we do is, um, is the following. We actually split the train data, oops, now. Oh. We split the train data into, I mean, we, we split our sample into train and test data. We train on part of it. And then we pretend that this one is like we got some new data from the big data source. And then the behavior of the model on this sample, oh, I'm sorry, on this, on this test data is the predictor of the behavior of the model when you take it to the wild. Now, this is an extremely important concept. Think about it again in terms of forecasting. We don't know what's going to be happening tomorrow. We don't know how your model is going to behave in the future. We don't have the data. So to do this, to, to, to actually verify how a model is going to behave in the future, we take the past data, we split it into two pieces, like very, very fast, where we train it, and then more kind of close to us fast, we check how well model, model performs there. And that check, that what tells us about, that the predictor of our, of the model performance in the future, okay? Now let's take a look at this. Uh, I, you know, again, this is all kind of, you know, hand wavy arguments. Let's actually take a look at this and see how it works, you know, in, in practice. So we're gonna look at the regression first. And this is what we're doing. So this is our data on the left. Right. Here is our data, initial data that you get. So what we do is we split this data into train set and test set. Now, um, there is no time here. So this data is just randomly split. I randomly selected 30% of the points. And so I got two data sets, right? One is going to be train data set. And this, what I'm going to give to the model. That's where I'm going to learn the behavior. And then I'll check the behavior on this set. Okay. So the idea is that until I'm ready to check the, the, the quality of the model, right? The model doesn't see this green data. Um, in fact, the, you know, it's the green data is sent only to a model applier, right? When you try to evaluate, it's never sent, we never use it to calculate the coefficients of the model. If, for example, we do linear regression, there are coefficients we compute. So we use trained data to compute those coefficients, we fix those coefficients, and then we take test data and apply them to test data to get the quality. All right. So these are uh, splitting into train and test set. Now, what I do next is I train the model on the training part, right? Which means that I only use those blue points to calculate 
the coefficients calculate the slope to draw this line. So it's only blue points that I used. Now, if I then calculate the error on this data set, it's going to be the 097. Now, how do I compute that error? Well, the usual way, right? I see how well my model predicts you know, those data points. Then I take this model, this line, and apply it to predict the values on the test set. Now, those points were not used to calculate the slope of the curve. And that's the key here. Those points were not used to calculate the slope. Now, I, I again do exactly the same thing. Um, I calculate the distance from these points to the line, which gives me the error in the prediction. And that's what I get. The way to understand this, we expect our model on the real data perform with this accuracy not with this one. Now, you might ask, why the hell do we compute this whatsoever if, we, if we're not going to use it? The answer is because we do know that this accuracy is not going to be better than that anyway, so we shouldn't bother. And we typically use this one to improve the model, right? We kind of look at this and say, okay, now look, if I cannot do sites so well on the train data, I will never do well on the test data. So let me work more on this. It's the same thing as if you're trying to prepare to exam and you try and you're answering the questions, you already looked through the answers. So if you cannot reproduce, you cannot do anything with them, there is very little chance you will do well on the questions that you never seen, right? So that's the idea. That does make sense, guys, because this is like the key to all machine learning. It is, yes. All right. Well, there was like 63 participants in the meeting. I hear only one voice. Come on, guys. Pick up. Type yeah. it. Say it. Yeah, we get it. Yes. We get it. You got it. Okay. Yeah. All right. What about validation uh, set? I mean, in standard, we should have uh, like free split data. Yeah. I knew this question would come. So, um, you know, what we just discussed so far, and I don't want you guys to get confused, right? But what we have discussed so far is a split into, actually, let me go back um, here. What we so far discussed is a split into train and test. And I want you really, really focus on this train and test thing for right now, right? To understand that. Later on, you know, as, as always, you know, the, 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 the hole is very deep, right? And there are sort of, there are more and more and more levels down there. And you're absolutely right. What you do is you can actually split this training set into two more, and then you train here, you verify, validate here. You don't like what you see, you kind of train again, and you validate here, you train again, and you validate here. But then you test on this guy. This is untouchable. This is untouchable. There is another way to do things is where you can split this, um, this one not in two pieces, but in you know more into more pieces into the folds. And then, for example, you train on these four folds, and then you use this one for validation then if it is the, the regime of what's called you know, cross-validation, then you in fact um, do that, as I just described. Um, then, well, I did it wrong. Then uh, you, for example, hold out this set and you train on the rest of them. Um, then you um, train You hold out this set, train on the rest of the sets, and you check on the verify on this one, et cetera, et cetera. That's what cross validation is. But again, at this moment, and you know, those are the techniques that we are you know, eventually using. But at this moment, the key, the, the most important part is that 
you know, you do whatever the heck you want within this training thing, but you don't touch this data because this one is the real predictor of what your algorithm is going to do um, when it is applied to unknown data, right? So if you're, if you're familiar with machine learning, absolutely, you know, think about cross-validation, use all that. If you're not, if it's your first time you see this train testing or maybe the second time, you know, stay on that level. All right, let's, let's move on a little bit here. So remember, this is an error, 097. Um, you know, write it down, by the way, somewhere. Actually, not this error, this, as I said, you know, it's, it's internal sort of for training. Um, so we know how well the model can fit, and this is how it actually uh, works on the data. Another way to think about this is the following. What we see on the left is how well your model can feed the data, right? Um, it also, also has a name, in fact. It has a name bias, right, the error. And so this tells you how well your model feeds the data, sort of potential of the model, right? how flexible it is, how good it can feed the data when it sees it, right? Uh, how, good is, how, good is, how good is your memory, not how good you can generalize and make conclusions, but how good you can memorize things. Yes, please. Uh, is it like uh, bottom, uh, sorry, uh, uh, I mean, look, um, it can be worse, but not much. You will see, I mean, theoretically speaking, when you average things out, it will not, right? But you might have a situation on the very particular, you know, very badly selected subset where, you know, some on one particular subset test error will get, uh, you know, less than train error, but that will be very, very rare. And if you run on multiple selections, right? Because remember, we do trade and test. I split it randomly. You, you know, you split it again. You will, on average, you will definitely always get test error above train error. So in this sense, yes, it's low boundary, low bound. Um, I will on average, but it's low bound on average. You know, the important word here on average. Um, I will, we'll see a, a, you know a, a picture in a few minutes. All right, guys. Mm -hmm. Okay, so there is a train error, and there is a test error, right? So it's around one, this is 0.97. Let's move on. Let's make more complicated, more complicated model, right? So we actually gonna go for high degree polynomials. It's the same data I just put here, you know, I put both green and blue on the same slide, but um, here's the train error, here's the test error, right? By the way, here's that, you know, weird, for example, situation where test error is, is, is less. Uh, but this is for particular, you know, if, if, start, if I start averaging on more iterations, uh, it probably will not be. I mean, it will not be. Now, notice what happens. And, uh, you know, when you increase uh, the degree of polynomial, things actually changing, changing some, some, sometimes even strangely, right? Your train error can drop, but your test error will actually increase. So, which means you can actually make your model perform better on your train data set, making it more complicated model and it will work better on your train data set, but it'll work worse on the test. Now, let me give you an example from which it becomes obvious why this is happening. Um, so this was polynomial regression. So what we do here is we just, instead of having a linear regression, we match different type of polynomials, right? Different degree polynomials. This is polynomial degree two, so it's parabola. This is polynomial degree five. I have no clue what it's called. This is polynomial degree 10, right? So it's, it is means you have, you know, coefficients to the power of 10. This one is what's called K and N regression. So K and N regression, the idea is extremely simple. Um, the value you predict is the value of your nearest neighbor. Now, if K is equal to one, it's your nearest neighbor. If K is equal to five, it's a value, it's an average of values of five nearest neighbors. Is K equal to 10? 
um, average of your 10 nearest neighbors, okay? So when k equal to one, your train error is actually zero because you are precisely matching, you know, your, your nearest neighbor is sort of yourself, right? So you predict precisely the value. But the test error, it's actually pretty large. You're making pretty big mistakes on all those points. The reason because you're not taking into account overall structure of the data. Now, when you increase the number of points that you take into account, for example, to five, and that's sort of what's your, that's the way the, the model th thinks about our function now. The train error will increase, but the test error will drop. Okay. You go for k equal to 10, yeah, it's actually test error will increase and the train error will increase. So, you know, in, 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 in increasing the complexity of the model does not necessarily help. In fact, in complexity here goes, you know, from right to left, right? Because that's the left one is the most complex one. Now, trees. Um, with trees, I wanted also you guys to show you know, the way trees work, because on one hand, kind of trees is, is the simplest model. On the other hand, uh, you know, it usually causes the most confusion. So the idea of tree modeling is that your data is being split into pieces. And within that piece, within each piece, you represent your data points with an average value, with a mean value. And so what we see on the left, is a regression tree. So the way it was built is the data was split at the value of uh, 42.5. And then on the left, uh, it's a constant. And on the right is a constant. And that's my model. So instead of just doing everything else, this is what I do. And this is the representation as a tree. The way it works, okay, if my x is, uh, you know, but for example here, I don't know, 70. I look at this condition, it is 70. So I need to go to this right tree. So the value is that I predict the value is 70, right? The same way, um, the model was trained on blue data points, uh, green left as test set. So I see the train uh, error is 096, the test error is 112, all right? Here, what I can do is I can, oh, and by the way, the, the whole sort of deep idea of trees is that how do you find that way to split the data, right? And that's sort of all the magic of trees. We're not gonna go into the you know, details how they do it, but pretty much after you split the data, then everything is easy. So um, trees right now, this is like, you know, the, the very shallow tree. It has only one level. We can keep splitting, going deeper uh, with three levels. And here are the tree with two levels. And so there are four regions here. And uh, well, let me, it's, it's red, so I want to change my color. And so, you know, there is region one, you know, region two, three, and four. Each of them corresponds to leave on the tree. And by the way, notice that even this sample model actually dropped train data significantly and drop, you know, test data is also less. Uh, of course, you know, test data, test error is, is higher than train error. We can keep moving. And then let's say I do regression tree and here is uh, the tree with one, two, three, four, five levels depth. That's how many uh, leaves you have. Um, that's the model. Notice the train error is getting even smaller. Well, the test data is, is, is uh, actually compared to the previous slide, I'm not even sure if it's improving or not. 
uh, yeah, it's dropping a little bit, but not much. And I know that if I can go further, um, I will decrease train error even more, but the test error will increase. So again, if I get very flexible functions that match well the training data, they will miss more and more test data. And so the test error will start increasing. Um, and that's general performance of the models, whatever model you take. Now, some models are more robust and they're less sensitive to the things. And uh, you know, one of those models is what's called random forest model. It is from what is called ensemble methods, where instead of one tree, you have entire ensemble, a group of trees. It's a forest of trees. And the way it works, is each tree is being built on a subset of your data. And then when you want to measure the value for another data point, you send it through all those trees, you get the prediction from each of the trees, and then you average it out. And so for random forest, this is a prediction you get and take a look at train and test, right? Again, train is slightly better than test but not you know, very big difference. And in terms of overall performance, this is the best we got out of all the data points. And so honestly, because, and that's without any tune up from me uh, in terms of you know, random forest. And that's why in fact, random forest, one of those few algorithms, sort of go-to algorithms, you know, working horses um, in machine learning, which you use uh, whenever you try to build you know, robust and scalable models. And, you know, in fact, that's not a very old algorithm. You know, Random Forest was introduced as an algorithm in like 2001, I think the paper, um, Leo Bregman paper on Random Forest. So, you know, one of those practical things, uh, whenever you try, whenever you build models, you usually start with something, the simplest one, and in our cases it would usually be like regression, right, linear regression, and then you go for something that is robust um, and uh, you know, can give you very good performance and that's usually random forest. Okay, now what you just saw is this behavior and I said it's quite general. And this is something you guys need to have in mind. This is pretty much the, the essence in, in machine learning. Um, when you have your models and you train and test them on different on, on a data set, right? The performance of your model on the training set tells you about flexibility of your model and tells you about the ability of the model to model the data. Again, it's also called bias. If you look at the training data, typically your model performance will improve with increased model complexity. The model performance on the training sample, which means you're gonna be fitting it better and better. Increase model complexity for, for polynomials, high degree polynomials, for trees, deeper trees, right? You will get better and better performance on training data. But, and that but is extremely important, we honestly care only about this. We care about performance on the test data. And notice what happens here. You take a very simple model, you know, the test error is pretty high. You start increasing complexity of the model, the test error drops, which is good. But then after a while, it started increasing. While your training data, training error is still decreasing. And so, the art of selecting the right model in machine learning is to be able to detect that interval, that level of complexity that gives you the best performance on a test sample. So again, training is needed for you to see uh, if the model makes any sense whatsoever, right? If it can model your data, because if your data is, you know, if you're trying to, to, to model 
say, sign function with a straight line, it's going to be very hard. You're never going to get it, and your training set, training error will be very bad. Um, but if you, you know, at the same time, that sort of can tell you, you know, that you need to make a more complicated model. But that the the low training error will not guarantee you that the model will generalize well or perform well on the data that it's never seen. That's on the test error. And so that's why you always, you split the data into train and train set and test set. You train your model in the training set. You check the, the, you know, the error. If it is high, then you, know, you, might, you might need to change the model or you might need to go for a more complicated model. But then you actually go and check it on testing. And until you get decent error on testing, you cannot guarantee that your model will work well on the data it never seen. Now, does this make sense? I will pause here and please ask questions. I have a question. Uh, a little bit uh, confusing for me that uh, higher polynomial uh, has uh, a higher error in training set. Uh, not in training, I mean, in test set. No, I mean training set, in a uh, slide on polynomial. Yeah, let's take a look quickly. Take a look. Um, you know, one thing that you need to, um, this one. Yes. Yeah, I see what you're saying. Um, you know, I'll be honest, you know, I ran this, I built this slides, you know, like hour and a half ago, uh, doing one run of the, you know, I just ran, just did this, the, 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 the split and ran it only once. For this to be consistent because we have random splits, you know, you can imagine the situation that the split is such that, uh, you know, you get, by whatever reason, better behavior here than there to actually you know, trust this. This was just for illustration purposes. To actually trust this, what I should do, uh, what you should do probably, right, is to do this train test split, random split, you know, 200 times, and then average out errors. And then it should do the right thing. Make sense? Yes. Okay. Anything else, guys? Okay, so what we did today, we started with, you know, we started talking about retail. We realized for retail, uh, you know, one of the key things you do is the forecasting. And so we talked about, you know, sales forecast. Um, then we quickly looked into different forecasting approaches and we, we decided that we're gonna be focusing on a regression type of forecast through machine learning. For this regression type of forecast, uh, you're gonna, you know, use either um, direct kind of point mapping or lagged data with the lags. And then we spent some time looking at uh, model training and testing and extremely important topic of data splitting. One other thing which I forgot to mention. Now, if you, uh, when we, because this is again, train and test set, right? Um, we talked about this split and uh, the way to do it you know, when you don't have time in the data is to kind of randomly permute your data, right? Randomly shuffle your data and then split it. Or another way, uh, you know, you can actually just take random samples from your data, right? And you take random samples all over your data and, you know, it's uniform random sampling, you know, and that's how you split your data. That's not the way to do it. But that works only if your data set does not have time in it. If it has time variable and for forecasting, you have time. You need, when you do train and test, you have always split based on the time axis so that the testing data points will go after the training. Um, this is sometimes called memory leakage if you don't do this. So the idea is you shouldn't be able to predict, uh, you know, past from the future, right? Um, 
And uh, that is very important. So in, in the case of the time data and sort of that's what you're gonna have with forecasting problems, you actually split it based on time. Then, you, you know, you can, you know, randomize internally if you want to. Make sense? Okay. Yep. All right, good. So we're done then for today. Um, and um, uh, we're gonna have a, Anwar we're gonna have a seminar on how to work with, how to predict the sales um, in a couple of minutes. All right, thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Actually, thank I you. forgot, guys. Hold on a second. I forgot the very last thing, uh, which is there is a great book, easy book, if you're interested. Um, it's a book about forecasting principles and practice. It talks a lot about the classical forecasting, right? This moving least squares, uh, the, the um, you know, exponential smoothing, ARIMAs, pretty much everything you want to know about um, the forecasting is in that book. So I strongly recommend it. It has examples in R, but you, don't, you, know, you can re-implement them in Python if you want to. Um, you don't need to, you know, to use R, but this is actually very good, quite easy, concise, and good to read. All right. Uh, yeah, the PDF, I think, you, you know, actually, the, I, I don't know if about PDF, but it's available online just as, as, as HTML, um, you know, on the, I think it's author website. So you can just Google it. Um, you will get it easily. All right. Thanks. Now we're done. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye now. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. Goodbye.